Well, this morning, uh, well, actually next Sunday, we're going to begin a series called The Road to Jerusalem, and it will be our series during Lent, and we're going to look at the, uh, some of the actual events that happened in Jesus' life while he was literally walking down the road toward Jerusalem. And so this morning, I thought I would like to just tell you a story. It's one of my uh, favorite stories from the, the Hebrew Bible. It's the story of Hosea and Gomer. And um, the, the Bible actually is a little sketchy on the story. It gives us a little information here and there, but it, you kind of have to read between the lines and fill in a little bit to, to get the whole story. And so that's what I'm going to do this morning. And uh, th this is how I believe it happened and how I want to share the story with you. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to read a few verses here and there uh, just so you can see the story as it's told in the scriptures and uh, be assured that I'm actually not making this up. This is really what happened. And um, so I, I want to begin uh, in the very first chapter at the very beginning of the story in verse 2. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her, for like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So Hosea, uh, you need to picture him as a fundamentalist preacher, the guy standing on the corner with the bullhorn, the sandwich sign on the front, it says, judgment is coming. On the back, it says, hell is hot. And Hosea stood on the corner and he denounced everything that needed denouncing. He talked about sin. He talked about uh, the consequences. His message was one of repent. It was one of turn or burn. This is how it is. And he stood out there and he preached and he denounced and he was good at it. Now, the problem with denouncing everything is it doesn't get you invited to very many parties. <laughs> Gomer was the opposite of Hosea. She had a hard life. She grew up in a rough home. She wore too much makeup, and her dresses were just a little too short. She didn't denounce sin. She rather enjoyed it. She got invited to every party. And somehow, Gomer and Hosea fell in love with each other. And nobody could understand it. Well, they say opposites attract. Well, it would hard to be more opposite than these two. Uh, a straight-laced preacher and a satin and lace party girl. And they fell in love and they got married. And I'll tell you, I would love to have been at the reception. I would love to see her family and friends and his family and friends gathered around the punch bowl. It would have been worth the price of a toaster. So let's continue the story. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And then the Lord said to Hosea, call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. So they have their first son about nine months into this marriage. And when he came to giving a name, Hosea was firm. He was going to be named Jezreel. Now, Jezreel was the well-known uh, name of a place where there had been this government massacre. And it was known as a place of corruption. And if you said the word Jezreel, everybody would just start shaking their heads and start talking about how corrupt the government was and how awful they were. It would be sort of like naming your firstborn child Watergate. <laughs> and so every time the teacher called his name in class, you would score a point in absentia. Then the second child. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And then the Lord said to Hosea, call her lo Ruhamah, which means not loved, for I will no longer show love to Israel, that I should at all forgive them. So their second child is born, and this child was a little girl. 
And they named her Loruhamah, which means not loved. What a terrible thing to name your child, not loved. I mean, it's hard enough growing up. It's, it's hard enough being a middle child, but to be stuck with a name like not loved. And a lot of uh, scholars think the double meaning of her name is that Hosea wasn't sure if she was his daughter or not. And that's a part of the meaning of the name. But at any rate, it's a horrible name to get stuck with. You can only hope they called her low for short. And then down in verse 8, and after she weaned Loruhamah, Gomer had another son. And the Lord said, call him Lo-Ami, which means not my people, for you are not my people and I am not your God. So any resemblance between this third child and Hosea is purely coincidental. And Hosea named him not mine. And that pretty much tells the whole story. So at this point, the relationship within Ho with Hosea and Gomer is getting pretty rocky. And uh, we aren't sure, that there's no details given, we don't know how it happened. But one day, Gomer just got up and left. She R-U-N-N-O-F-T. <laughs> she was gone. She decided that she didn't want to be tied down to this old-fashioned Bible thumper and three preschoolers. She'd had enough Bible studies and diapers. So she packed her bags and she left. There was a note on the table that said, you can color me gone and you can pick up the kids at my mother's. So Hosea got home, he went and got the kids, and then this became his routine. Um, he was a single parent before the, the, the phrase had ever even been coined. He was left with three preschoolers, two of them weren't even his, and when I try to imagine the next part of the story, I know that for too many people, this is unfortunately a reality. So Hosea preached and he denounced all day and then he came and got the kids from daycare and took them home. He spent some time with them and he read them stories and he fixed them supper and he gave them a bath and he put them to bed. And I imagine it happened something like this. He sat down in a chair in his bedroom with the lights off and he was praying. He started to cry. And he said out loud, God, why me? I do everything you've asked me to do. I stand on that street corner and I say the things you want me to say. And people laugh at me. People spit on me. I do everything you've asked me to do. And the only person I have ever loved has walked out on me. And I don't know what to do. God, you have no idea what this is like. You have no idea how bad this hurts. And then God speaks to Hosea some of the most powerful words in the Hebrew Bible. God says, Hosea, I know exactly how you feel. Because you see, I love Israel with all my heart. And Israel has turned her back on me and gone and worshiped other gods and left me. Hosea, I know exactly how it feels to love someone and them not love you back. So yeah, actually, I know exactly what it's like. And then uh, these verses that are in the second chapter, this is amazing because it's like Hosea and God are saying, well, we've both been jilted, now what are we gonna do? And listen to what God says in chapter two, verse 14. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. 
So Hosea says, God, what are we going to do? And God says, I'm going to wear her back. I'm going to allure her. I'm going to win her back. And the day will come when she will call me my husband and no longer my master. Oh, these aren't words of religion. These are words of romance. God says, I'm going to go get Israel. I'm going to win her back through love. Charles Wesley wrote this beautiful hymn, one of my favorites, Jesus, lover of my soul. And it sort of points toward that love that God has for us. Because we have this idea sometimes that when we sin, that it breaks some cosmic rule somewhere. But the truth is, when we sin, it breaks hearts. We break each other's heart. We break God's heart. And God's love changes from that kind of joyous love you have at a wedding to that kind of suffering love like Jesus had on the cross. And so God said, I'm going to go win her back, Hosea. Why don't you do the same? In chapter 3, the Lord said to me, go show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. Though they turn to other gods and they love sacred raisin cakes, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. And then I told her, you are to live with me many days and you must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man and I will behave the same way toward you. For the Israelites will live many days without a king or a prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or household gods. And afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessing in the last days. <laughs> so Hosea went and he found Gomer. She was actually working as a temple prostitute in the temple of Baal. Baal was a fertility god, and, and prostitution was a part of their ritual. I want to say a quick word about the raisin cakes. For some reason, that was the way they, that was the offering they brought to this false god, Baal. They brought raisin cakes, and they put it on the offer, and they worshipped it to him. They, they offered it to him as worship. And so, that's why um, Hosea is condemning the practice. He's saying, you know, don't, don't bring these raisin cakes to this false god as a sacrifice. I want you to be completely clear that there is nothing wrong with eating raisin cakes, okay? <laughs> I don't want anybody to leave here thinking like Dolly Madison is the Antichrist or something. Uh, the, the point was they were offering them to a false god. There's nothing wrong with the, the raisin cakes. So I just want to clear that up because uh, this is how rumors get started. Uh, <laughs> But there's nothing wrong with that. But you know, the priest at the temple would not let um, Hosea take Gomer home until he had bought out her contract. And so he had to pay 15 shekels of silver and, and uh, a, 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 what was the, the rest of 15 shekels of silver, silver and a, and a, 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 a lethic of barley. Now the interesting thing is 15 shekels of silver is half the price of a slave. So um, they, they sold her back to him for half price. Um, she was damaged goods. They didn't even want her. So I don't know, again, how it happened. But in my imagination, it was something like this. As the door opened, and she was surprised to see it was Hosea. And he said, I have always loved you. And there is nothing that you can ever do that will make me stop loving you. I've paid the price for your freedom. Now come on and let's go home. And she got up and she went home. And you know, again, the Bible doesn't say anything, but I like to imagine, I, I hope anyway, that she learned to love her children and become a good mother. 
I hope that she learned to love Hosea and become a good wife. And, you know, it, it, uh, I, I like to think that not only did she change, but I like to think this whole experience changed Hosea. And he threw away the bullhorn, and he tore up that sign that said, judgment is coming and um, hell is hot. And he got a new sign. And it said, God loves you. It's, it's this incredible story. And it was a small town and everyone knew their story. And so some evenings you would see them walking down the sidewalk holding hands and there was not a dry eye in the house. What a beautiful story. What an incredible love story of how much someone can love someone else. And just when you think that that is one of the most incredible love stories you've ever heard, then God says, not only is this a story about Hosea and Gomer, but it's a story about how God loves us. It's a story about God's relationship with us as well. Because God created us to have relationship with us. God created us because God loves us. And God wants to be a part of our lives and to guide us in our lives. But somewhere along the way, all of us, we decide that we can probably do better if we did this on our own, that we can have more fun without God. And sometimes following God seems a little boring, and so we decide to do things our way, and we go off on our own. But then somehow, Jesus always finds a way to make himself known to us and real to us. And he says to us, I have always loved you. There is nothing that you can ever do that will make me stop loving you. I've paid the price for your freedom. Why don't you come? and follow me. And I have to tell you for the life of me, I don't know how anybody can do anything other than follow Jesus. Amen.